What's going on, everybody? Happy Saturday. Appreciate everybody stopped in for overtime last night. Uh, we hit a little bit onto this video last night, and this has taken me a while to really go through. So I may bounce around a little bit, a little bit longer of a video. And this is going to reference a series that a, I guess you're going to say YouTuber Carl Jobst put out. And this starts back in August 2021. I'm looking at the day of the upload on here. So, if you, this is going to reference a lot what I was talking about with sports cards. So, this does deal with retro video games, but he brings up some history behind um, the fraud and deception on how it's come about through, I mean, we're going back probably two centuries almost, um, with how different things came, come about, how history keeps repeating itself, even with the coins in the 80s. To, he talks a little bit about the sports cards, uh, video games, and then he ends with uh, the new VHS tapes. So it's like a three-part series. It, it, I guess originally his first video like went insanely crazy. He did a follow-up, and then the third one is like 10 minutes long. Talking about a court case now that's out onto this stuff. So I'm not too sure how many people have ever seen this video. It's got over 1.5 million views, so you might have seen it. You might not have. I'm going to pull it up on the screen. We're going to play little bits of clips, so bear with me trying to get to the right parts of the clips. I couldn't bookmark them all. But I'm going to put a link to all three videos. If you guys have time, watch this. A lot of good information is on this, uh, especially if you have some rain or you're driving for the 4th of July weekend. Good stuff. All right, so again, this is the guy's YouTube channel here. Again, links will be in the description. He's, this is all about exposing fraud and deception in the retro video uh, game market. Uh, Shannon and Smitty actually gave me a link to this and said I might have to break it down because <laughs> uh, me watching this stuff can take a while. This one's 52 minutes long. I think the next one's like an hour. There's one like 10 minutes. So it might get two hours, two hours total. But he starts off here talking about tulips and i mean when i first started watching this you know you kind of got like the voice from uh, the wonder years but it actually is really interesting video so let me hit play here and i'll stop it in about a minute or so into this just to talk about some of this stuff dutch golden age an event happened known as tulip mania where the price of tulip bulbs reached insane levels at the time, tulip bulbs were a luxury item that were highly desired for their intense colors. And as their popularity slowly increased over the years, the price inevitably went up. Eventually, people began noticing the trend of rising prices and started to speculate on the market. Speculating means buying a good not due to need, but purely in the hopes that the price will increase so that you can sell it at a later date for profit. With investors beginning to flood the tulip market, this began a positive feedback loop, driving prices up even more. As the price increased faster, not wanting to miss out on the opportunity, even more people started buying in. This caused the first recorded speculative bubble in history. And there are two important things to know about these types of bubbles. First, no one buying actually wants tulips. They just hope to make money. And secondly, this process is not sustainable and eventually people stop buying and the price crashes. Those left holding tulips lose everything as their value plummets back to normal. I want you to remember this process, because the exact same thing is happening with video games right now. But the difference is that this current video game bubble isn't an accident. You see, if you know how speculative bubbles work, you can theoretically create them at will. All you would have to do is raise the perceived price of a good quick enough so that speculators see the trend and start entering the market. Then, you can just sit back and let the positive feedback loop do the work. Profiting from your artificially created bubble by buying games early and selling later is rather obvious. But there are actually smarter ways to make money, ways that incur far less risk. In the current video game market and the collect... Okay, I'm going to cut it right there because there's a lot of information there. Like I said, if you got time to watch this whole video, it's insane. So, I got it, the Tula part, kind of uh, <laughs> out there way back in left field. But he makes good points during this. One, people who were buying tulips did not want tulips. 
The people left holding tulips lost money. Now I know it, if you think about it, people left holding sports cards are going to lose money. No, the people who bought high are going to lose money. That's the point where I'm trying to come across that, and he was too. But there was one part here. Let me see if I can get it pulled up to the screen. That's speculation. Bubbles always burst. They do. No matter where you go, just like balloons will always deflate over time, bubbles will burst. And when you do, those people that were caught at the end are the ones that are going to be hurting. I'm trying to get to where this graph is at a little bit better. I guess I'm not going to win. Uh, I'm not going to get to it. All right, because I can't get to the right time loop. But anyhow, I'll leave it on bubbles always burst. If you look at the graph that was on there, you notice that it looks similar to what is shown with sports cards today. All right. So it shows some history behind this and when it started way back yonder in, you know, was it 1800s or something like that, where this stuff started really going on. And it just gives an idea on you know how this is all going about and he even goes into like this is not by accident this is you know people are buying this stuff in advance and then they use the media like with the video games to hype the stuff up didn't we do the same thing well i shouldn't say we didn't the same thing happen with sports cards you know when you think about it the mickey man on the jordan stuff the triple logo man <laughs> That didn't even come close to the six million they thought. Kind of crazy, kind of crazy. All right, let me flip. And I'm just looking at my time stance. We're going a little bit further in time. I mean, if you go through this now, just so you know, this video is about heritage auctions. And I think I forgot to say this in about WADA games. So WADA games came out of nowhere. <clears throat> and when they did... They basically took over, um, like, high popularity with their grading, which was just in shock because as it starts progressing through these videos, you'll notice there's, like, a Super Mario Brothers 1 who it's encased, it has a high grade, but it's given an A+, because it still has that plastic uh, seal on it. You gotta, gotta cut open, like, the hobby boxes. Well, there's a slash into it which should have gave it a C plus. And it says talks about the owner grading his own stuff. And this is why I say with a lot of these new startup grading companies, I don't agree with them grading their own cards at all. Now, I don't care if you say, well, I'm not grading my own cards, but Bob and John are grading my cards. How do we really know? I mean, we got grading subjective, but now we just add a new level to being subjective. You know, you guys get what I'm saying. All right, let me look here. Make sure I'm covering everything. Oh, Wada Games was actually purchased in July of 2021 by Collectors Universe. So they're under the umbrella now with PSA and Golden Auctions. Kind of, just kind of crazy, you know, when you look at Collectors Universe buying up all this stuff. You got Fanatics buying up all this stuff under one umbrella. I, I personally liked it when everybody had their own different entities. So I didn't mind golden or golden auctions. I didn't mind Collectors Universe buying PSA, but then when you start throwing golden in there and you start getting all these other things into there, it starts leading to people talking. And regardless of you know the intent when they do all this stuff and what's going on, it just leads to speculation, as you can see what speculation is by his definition that he got. All right, let's go forward here. 37. 17. All right. Games and conventions. In June 2019, I was a guest at a gaming convention. The weekend of the event, I noticed a small group of individuals who were hurriedly acquiring sealed and complete in box games from vendors. At one point, I witnessed an individual who I later learned to be Mark Haspel returning to the WADA Expo booth while holding a stack of NES games. I did find it a little strange, but was unaware of any affiliation that person may have had with WADA, so I didn't think much of it at the time. 
It's obviously not illegal for the founders of Water Games to collect video games, and it's impossible to prove intent, but these examples just strengthen my opinion that they knew what was about to happen, and they were preparing for it. Now, before we get to the conclusion, I want to teach you about an event in history that might be relevant to what's happening right now. Okay, I'm going to continue playing here in a second on that event. This here, just think about it. Owners of companies are out there buying these video games in advance. Take out the word owners, and we're just going to put millionaires are out there buying these items, because we'll take out games before the bubble. And people are finding it odd, like, why is this guy buying $2 million in sports cards? Hmm. Interesting. Is it because they love sports cards? Or is it going to be the next bubble that's being created? The Great Coin Collecting Bubble of the 80s. Believe it or not, this kind of crazy bubble surrounding a collectible has been seen before. Not to this extent, but still, this isn't a new thing. In the 80s, it wasn't video games, it was coins. PCGS is the world leader in coin grading, and on its website it tracks something called the PCGS 3000 Index. It's an index of the value of coins, similar to something like the Dow Jones. In the historical chart, you can see a massive spike occurring in the late 80s. After crashing, the price has still not recovered to level seen 30 years ago, and this is without even considering inflation. So what caused this bubble? Well, according to an article posted on AntiquesAge.com, it was the development of slabbing and the introduction of third-party certification. Slabbing is where a grading company will take a coin, encase it in plastic, and give it a rating. Two grading companies were formed around this time, PCGS and NGC. The article goes on to state that the arrival of PCGS and NGC changed the industry nearly overnight. Now dealers, collectors, and investors could buy or sell slabbed coins sight unseen, because they all trusted the grades given by the major grading services. If you're beginning to get a sense of deja vu, that's completely understandable. This is literally the exact same thing that's currently happening with video games. And other markets out there we're gonna use markets here other hobbies even better off so great points that he makes here is that when you look at the coin piece of it all 30 years later they still never made it to where that bubble was or even it came up close to it is stuff still risen yes they attribute that to the grading that went on between those two companies. Everybody skyrocketed, stuff went boom, everybody wanted it. It happens right then and there. And then you see afterwards, everything sinks down into price onto it. Now, as he said, deja vu, this is happening all over. Comics, non-sports cards. Um, I don't know too much about memorabilia if it's really spiked or not. I don't really pay too much attention to that at all. But I, I really found this video to be very informative and interesting with a lot of the stuff onto it because they really go into good detail with this. And there's just so much in here. Every time I sit there and keep playing these clips, I'm hearing other things that I must have missed because I was, you know, I don't want really to use the word daydreaming, but I got caught up into another comment on there. And I'm thinking more about what he's saying on to it. I mean, realistically, I'll probably watch this whole thing again. Because there's some just good stuff into this. I think that was the last part of this. Yes. Okay. So, as you can see, it keeps going on. Um, this all talks, if you want to really get in depth on how Heritage Auctions doesn't disclose uh, information. Which is going to be talked about in the next video. So, just say an example, I become, a new grading company starts up. I become an investor into that company. And then say, I go out there and we're grading, let's say, I don't know. I don't want to use sports cards. We're grading stamps. I don't know. Stamps came to my mind. I'm sure there's somebody out there who grades stamps. But 
during that time frame, I'm like, yeah, I just I make some unreal purchase of grading a stamp that has a high quality, I don't know, 60-something, 60 66 out of whatever, 80 or whatever it is, like how coins are done. And I'm like, oh, this is just the tip of the iceberg. This thing here is going to reach a million dollars. If I don't reference myself as like part investor into that company it's grading, there's some uh, stuff with the Federal Trade Commission, all this other stuff, because it's not showing who the investors are and stuff that could come back and bite me. And he talks about this during these videos. There's a lot of legal stuff that went on during this. So end state of this first video is this video gets pushed out and everything. It gets mass amounts of views. He even says, like, hey, I invited these guys to talk about their stuff before I pushed this video out. Nobody ever got back to me. I was told they would in a week. Never happened. And so he ends up putting up a follow-up video because, like, this video was on all kind of articles and stuff. This guy even got hit saying it because this video is why the bubble bursted and people were starting to get scared selling stuff. No, it's because it hit its all-time peak. It was going to bust. It's not because of this video. This video is informative for anybody who was like trying to get in and make money, and that's the bad part. Whenever you're coming in just to make money off of something and you're just not in as a uh, pure collector, that you could really, really get hurt into it depending on where you come into it as a buyer. All right. I'm going to flip over to this one here. All right. So again, like I was saying, this is a follow-up video he did was about four months later, something like that. With it, it talks about what a co-founder accused of selling the games he graded himself and all this stuff. It, you know, that's the part where I just don't agree on. I got you might have a fantastic grading company and stuff like that. And that's where I was talking about in overtime, you know, if I was the head honcho of one of these bigger grading companies back in SGC, PSA, or something like that, you know, if I send my cards in, you know, is that greater down there? Like, oh man, this is freaking extreme stuff here. I better grade this stuff good, you know, in fear of my job because he can go in there and see that I'm the one who graded this and he can come down here and question me and I don't need that hassle. I mean, I don't know what goes through people's minds. I'm just throwing out stuff in my own opinion here. And I just, me, I would say, hey, just don't grade your own stuff. But I got it. If you're the top of the line grading company, you want stuff to flow through. Maybe you should have to submit it underneath an alias name so nobody knows who in that company's the stuff is. Or, you know, I don't know, something like that there. Where you have to submit the stuff, you get a mass name of like John Doe or... Something like that out there, and nobody knows who it is when it's going through the grading. Don't know. Just some of my thoughts. I don't know if they can see who who sent the stuff in or not. I'm guessing they can, because normally you got that uh, submission thing right in front of you. All right. So again, like I said, this is like a follow up on to it, and he actually brings a lawyer involved into this, and it shows a lot like how all this stuff was pushed into the media to make things like hey go look in your closets for sports cards or video games just us going nuts out there you might have this da, da 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 the more you push that out there the more people are like whoa i can have something worth money and if the sad part is how many people out there are actually paying a hundred two hundred four hundred thousand dollars for an old video game I mean, it's kind of insane when you think about it. Just same with a piece of cardboard. It has somebody's picture on it, maybe an autograph. But it, it do, the prices just never line up. All right, let me... It's 220 where I want to start this. All right. Responsible has surfaced. And I have to say, this new information hasn't improved the situation. The depth of their dishonesty is worse than I previously thought. Since my video, most of the parties have responded, and one thing is certainly clear. They do not care. Even with Universal Damnation... Okay, you guys can sit there and watch the video and see what's all said here, but... I remember some of this stuff coming out last year where they talked about this, and... 
You know, it is what it is. If there's foul play into it, you're going to get caught. And that's where it goes into the federal trade and all this other stuff onto it. Uh, there are, I didn't realize there were certain laws and regulations out there. It might not be against shill bidding and stuff like that, per se. I might be wrong. If there's a lawyer watching this, correct me. But I know there's other rules out there of market manipulation and stuff like that there that you can get hit on. All right, so we did the two-minute one. We're going to scroll through here to the lawyer. Now, like I said, if you guys have time, watch this stuff. It's great. So, that's the lawyer that's talking about this stuff. She's not the one in the case. So, what she goes through and she talks about is the 2019 Heritage pre-release of Super Mario Brothers. Or, re-release reference Super Mario Brothers. And she goes into depth onto this. It talks about... Wada Games press release reference the Carolina collection, and then the appearance of Dennis Kahn, who is uh, like one of the head dudes might of up in out uh, that Waka or Wada Wada Games. I don't know why I say Waka Wada Games, and uh, with that he appeared on Pawn Stars. So basically, the gentleman that had the the item goes in there, and you guys know. The guys, Rick or whoever, Chumley's like, hey, we're not experts. We got to get somebody to come in here. Well, they bring in the guy from Wada Games, which is Dennis Kahn. He comes in there in no time frame do those two say they know each other. Which is, you know, a no-no unless the show purposely bleeped it out. But the point is, is was it on there because you have Dennis Kahn saying that this thing, you know, I've seen offers decline to 300000 all that. Is that hyping something up? So really cool when you start listening to stuff and actually get to hear a lawyer's perspective onto this. Now, I'll, I'll play a little bit of it here for you. Issues. Hi there, my name's Alita, and I'm a lawyer licensed in California and D.C. I run the YouTube channel Legal Bites, where we explain the law one bite at a time. Carl asked me to take a look at the situation from a legal perspective, and so I thought I would take a few minutes to highlight a few things. The situation, as Carl has described it, is obviously very concerning to say the least. But is there anything here that would lead us to believe that there might be something happening that is actually unlawful? To figure that out, we'll look at the Federal Trade Commission Act, or the FTC Act, and the FTC guidelines, which are the regulations that give guidance to courts in these kinds of situations. Then we'll apply the rules to three situations. First, the 2019 heritage audited by the audience. All right, we're going to skip that play piece. second, where the public's knowledge of that connection would change how the public gives weight to that endorsement. For example, it's pretty common nowadays to see influencers reviewing certain products and then linking to those products on their platform so that viewers can go and buy them. According to FTC guidelines, if those influencers are getting paid for those reviews in any way through affiliate marketing or through free products, they have to let the viewer know in that particular product review. And that's because that type of a connection isn't always something that would be obvious to the viewer. And at the same time, someone that has a financial incentive in the success of a product can change how much weight we're going to give to that review. Now Perfectly said there by her. So a lot of the people out there that are taking these like ads on and stuff like that there, they have to put out this is a sponsored ad because during that, unless it's predetermined they can say whatever they want, they don't want you talking bad about it. They want you talking good. At the same time frame, what's my piece in the pie out of this, you know, as an influencer? A am I getting, you know, money per click, per person I send over, and everything else like that? So you always have to put that stuff out. And that's why a lot of times you'll hear that I'll say that I'm not affiliated in any way with this. I'm just talking about the product. All right, I'll go back into it. Sorry for pausing, everybody. Sorry, sorry. Now, applying this to the 2019 Heritage Auctions press release about the infamous copy of Super Mario Brothers sold for $100,000. In that statement, several individuals were quoted about the same transaction. You had Wada Games president Dennis Kahn and the buyers of the item, Jim Halperin, Zach Geig, and Rich Leche. If Carl's information sources are correct, all of these individuals have a financial connection of some sort to Wada Games, either as investors of Wada Games or as members of the corporate board. 
So applying the FTC's requirements, we first have to ask ourselves whether this kind of a connection is reasonably expected by the audience in a transaction like this. And it's reasonable to say no, that we wouldn't expect there to be a big deal made about some outrageous sale of an item between various people with financial interests common to the certifying company. So that's the first question in the analysis. Let's move on to the second one. The next one is if the public knew about that connection between these people, would they give less weight to the endorsements made in the statement? Boom, right there. If the public knew about who purchased it and their ties to that institution, would they recognize that sale as a, air quotes, because you can't see me do it, comp? To lay that out, it's important to understand what in this whole scenario is giving weight in the first place to the crazy valuations of these retro video games. And the thing that gives arguably more credibility than anything else here is the fact that there was an actual sale transaction that happened and that people are hearing about that sale. It's reasonable that most consumers would assume that a transaction is proof of the actual market price of an item. That is, it's a common idea that the real value of an item is the market price or the price at which the market will support. Specifically, the point at which the buyer and the seller will agree to transfer ownership. The reasoning behind that is, of course, the buyer isn't going to buy something if they think that the item is overpriced. And likewise, on the other hand, the seller isn't going to sell something to someone if they think that they can get a better price somewhere else. company that the master elite roofing companies are. So when you use the word puffery, you got to listen to the whole thing on to it. I don't want to play this whole big segment onto here. But it talks about puffery. And it, it really made a lot of sense when you listen to it. Uh, the weight and credibility, how much of it puffs up the inflation price and stuff like that. The part that I want to try to look at. Uh, here we go individual's exposure to liability. Now, finally, what about the Pawn Stars episode? If there is an undisclosed financial connection between WADA Games and Pawn Stars, we would be looking for some kind of a statement endorsing the product. But in this particular case, I think it actually would be a little bit more difficult to say that the guys at Pawn Stars are opening themselves up to liability here. At most, it appears that what they're doing here is highlighting WADA Games as an authority in this space. But importantly, the Pawn Stars guys don't make any representations that they are well-informed in the area of retro video games themselves. To the contrary, the whole reason that they bring Dennis Khan from WADA Games is because the Pawn Star guys say that they really don't know enough about the market to be able to adequately evaluate the item themselves. And so they say that they look to the labeling on the game, do some basic research about WADA Games, and conclude that WADA is probably a good enough authority to turn to to figure out the proper estimate of the item. All of this seems like basically what any reasonable consumer would do. There's nothing here that jumps out at me as an overt endorsement of the item, although they do give WADA a certain sense of legitimacy and credibility by bringing Khan onto the show. So in the case of the Pawn Stars episode, I would say that the Pawn Stars guys are actually less likely to be exposed to liability here. But as one last bit of detail here, if we turn our attention to the seller who actually brought the item in the first place, the same might not be true for him. Again, assuming Carl's information sources are correct, there appears to be another undisclosed financial relationship between this seller and WADA Games. And by all appearances on the show, it looks like they don't know each other at all, and he may even be surprised to see someone from WADA Games showing up there. Applying the same analysis from the two press releases, the statements that he makes about what he sees about the valuation of the item mean that there might actually be some exposure to liability for him and WADA Games and potentially Dennis Khan as an individual as well for FTC violations. So those are all my thoughts on the situation. Thanks so much to Carl for including me. In so I, I enjoyed hearing her thoughts. Like I said, you got to play the whole thing through. I, I you got to admit, Pawn Stars they always bring in experts onto because they're not experts. And I don't think the fault should ever want to Pawn Stars or anything like that. People use Pawn Stars and like Shark Tank and stuff to get themselves noticed with their, with their business, their products and stuff like that there. What I, I, I think they should have disclosed, you know, if those two knew each other on there and their relationship prior to it. 
if that's in fact true. But if you have to go back to the first video to see exactly what uh, uh, Carl was talking about in there onto this. But listen to a lawyer's perspective onto this taking this part of this information and applying it to the bubble with sports cards, it really starts making you think. Because if this is now ha going on with video games, you'll see some of the outcome here coming up. So that was the last part of that. Third part. This just came out yesterday by him, and I know we talked a little bit about in overtime last night. I know Shannon came in with Smitty and we were talking about this. So, there is a, uh, well, this all started off with Reddit. And you guys all pretty much know what Reddit is, so I'm not going to go into it. But somebody came in there and they posted this here. If you want to hit pause to read it, go ahead. But basically, a lawyer uh, said his firm is preparing a class action case to be filed against Collector's Universe and Wada Games. Why Collector's Universe? Because they bought Wada Games. So they got somehow put underneath this umbrella with it all because they bought them. So I'm going to go past this here. Let me find out where I'm at my piece of paper here. Actually, I'll play this part. I'll play this part. Never mind. Titled, Potential Class Action Against Water Games in California. The user outlined that they were an attorney and game collector, and that their law firm was preparing a class action case to be filed against Collector's Universe and Water Games. The point of the post was to ask members who had graded games with Water if they'd like to join the class as a plaintiff. It also confirmed that this lawsuit would address claims of unfair business practices, RICO violations, and fraud claims. What I found pretty interesting was a reply from the supposed attorney to a question asking if I was involved. They stated, We do not have direct involvement from Jobs or Abramson. However, the work those gentlemen did absolutely convinced the attorneys and staff here, especially the non-collectors, to take this matter on. They did amazing work, and we are really grateful to them for doing the legwork and laying everything out as they did. Everyone was obviously very excited, but understandably skeptical. Anyone can make a Reddit post, and there was no way of knowing if it was legit. Truthfully, the odds of this actually being real was pretty low. But so, you know, I agree, because you don't know. Is it going to be true? Anybody can make that out. Oh, is it already come but up? Shockingly, My bad. a month later on the 10th of May, a class action lawsuit was filed in the United States District Court. The defendants were Water Incorporated and Collector's Universe, which now owns Water Games. The claims listed were RICO, unfair competition law, false advertising, intentional misrepresentation, non-disclosure, and breaches of the Consumer's Legal Remedies Act. The Look at that. Six things. And it makes you wonder if, like, say this guy Carl Jobs actually does this with sports cards, how this could blow apart. If he goes through and get, digs up all this information, there's going to be a law firm out there that's going to want to press this issue. One, because their law firm will get their name, you know, put out there onto this and everything. But if they happen to win that case... It skyrockets, the, you know, the, the business itself. But it's also good because it puts in the public's eye, like, wait a minute here. Did this really go on? Is this wrong? Just like taking friends and family payment for goods and uh, for, uh, for a goods or a service done, you know. It's all that stuff there that's getting cracked down upon. And it's a shame. Uh, with a, with a lot of it. I'm just trying to check my notes here. We're going to move to 625 in this. Don't remember why, but we are. Adequately notify the public or update their website regarding the delays, thus providing false advertising. My video also makes an appearance. The filing reads, On or about August 23, 2021, an independent journalist named Carl Jobs released a YouTube video called Exposing Fraud and Deception in the Retro Video Game Market, which highlighted many of the problems and misstates by Wata and Alperin's association with the company. Also in August of 2021, journalist, attorney, and video game collector Seth Abramson wrote online articles also detailing many of the false statements 
statements and unfair business practices detailed herein. The reluctance to send in their games for grading, hoping to sell them for profit. However, at the... Okay, guys, I wanted you to read this statement here. I'm sorry, I started a little bit too late. I must have wrote the wrong time down. But it says video game collectors rush to send their own sealed games into WADA for grading believe they could sell the games for profits as market soared. <laughs> that's going to be a hard one there to honestly win because that's just pure greed people do. And that same thing happened with PSA back at SGC, backlog, now getting stuff back, lost money. A lot of these guys out there are not getting orders paid for because they didn't collect out front. It's crazy. This says, still the company advertised false and overly optimistic turnaround times on their website. Uh-oh. Wonder who all falls into that stuff, right? They weren't notified delays in advance of their purchases. It's just, when you read this stuff, it's like, this is the same stuff that happened with sports cards. Same thing. We got a lawsuit here already out there on this here. I mean, is there going to be more to follow on this, everybody? What do you guys think offhand? Uh, I'm just getting where I need to bookmark at here. But really good videos by this guy. Um, it's just crazy with probably the amount of effort and time he put into this stuff. He had no idea it was going to spiral like it did and, you know, catch on, go viral and all this stuff. But... Like I said, taking the information he put out there into what went on with sports cards really draws a lot of question. It really does. To all kind of people's thoughts, opinions that went on out there. I mean, wow. Massive. Guys, let me know. I'm going to go to one last part into this. But let me know in the comments what you guys think. If you guys actually take time to watch uh, like the two hours of these videos, you know... Just how much does it open up your eyes to all this stuff that goes on out there? It's 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 immense. I mean, it's not even enough. I probably could come online and do it overtime. We'd probably be on three, four hours plus just talking about it, especially with what all we know and see. You know, whether we what we see out there is true for or not, because words can be deceptive. It's how you interpret it long run, and. People like to jump around on how they word stuff so it leaves gray area a lot. But let's move on to right here. Market. Sealed VHS tapes. About a week ago, a sealed VHS copy of Back to the Future sold for $75,000. What? This made headlines, of course, because you can't pump a market without publicity. Mind you, people have been trying to pump VHS tapes for a while now, and the tactics seem very similar to what we saw with video games. For example, take these articles from last year. Why your vintage video games could be worth a small fortune. Why your old video games may be worth millions. Now, take this article that just came out recently. Rarity and nostalgia. Old VHS tapes could be worth a small fortune. To the naive reader, this just looks like any other random news article. Some light reading. But in reality, articles like these are very calculated, and they are designed to pump the market. The articles always contain two critical pieces of information, a high-value sale and the name of an auction house. People with connections will buy stock in an untapped collectibles market and then flood the market with hype in the form of articles, videos, and press releases. They do it all the time, and they are very successful at it. Boom! Well said. Well said. I, I I can't even say it better myself. He gives it straight to you. That's a pump and dump. Pump and dump. And just how it goes about being done. And, you know, trying to find the proof onto it. We all know it's there. But we just can't, you know, physically prove it. Unless you're part of that selective few that are, like, bound by, you know, blood brother, pinky swear. Illuminati secret old things that go on out there. I don't know. I just threw a bunch of stuff together. But anyhow, hopefully you guys enjoyed this and you go to have some time to watch these videos that they put out. 
Really, uh, he that he put out really, really good stuff. Thanks again to Shannon Smitty for sending this to me. I appreciate it. I actually, like I said, it kind of reminded me at first when I started watching this. I'm like, what in the wonder years am I watching right now? And after about the first 10 to 15 minutes, I was hooked. I was literally hooked. I wasn't just hooked because I got to see Mario bouncing around and trying to see how quick they can beat the level and stuff. But the information out there and how he put it in uh, time perspective, it just brought a new light onto what I know and what I've heard and what I've seen out there. And it just puts it in a bigger perspective to me. Again, thank you everybody for watching this. Thank you to Carl Jobs for the videos out there on this stuff. It, phenomenal. Phenomenal. Um, thank you to Shannon and Smitty for linking me up with this because it, it does go hand in hand with a lot of stuff. Whether you use the tulips, the coins, the video games, the sports cards, now going into retro VHS tapes. Oh my gosh. It's like it's a never anything sneakers, all that stuff out there. All right, guys, have a good one. Talk to you all next video.